There we go. So, hello everyone. Um, this is uh, PowerCon 2021. Uh, I am having a session about Python type annotations. And my name is Matthias Delvig. And this session is not of the presentation type, it should be more of a discussion type. If you see this shared screen here, there's a small outline of um, points I want to talk about today. And I just realized maybe someone doesn't even know what type annotations and pop are. So I'll try to make a very short introduction. Um, I assume you are uh, familiar with Python it itself, and Python is a um, duck typing uh, programming language, and duck typing is usually referred to. Uh, if it sounds like a duck, then it's probably a duck, and I usually say if it sounds like a duck, then for all intents and purpose of your program, it's safe to assure, safe to assume it is a duck, and that's duck typing. Uh, in contrast to that, if you would know, uh, for example, C++, C++ is a strongly typed system. And there you can say, at compile time, the compiler checks if the thing you hand over to a function is of the exact type the function expects. And if not, this is a hard failure and you won't even get to the point where any code is running. This is kind of the two extremes of that situation. And Python type annotation is able to get you into a middle ground there. So um, to start off here, it is a feature introduced with Python 3. Maybe uh, I don't get it right, but I think it's about around Python 3.5. Um, uh, there is one project in the pulp ecosystem that is already using it, and that is the CLI and its plugins. I think there are a lot more projects that could benefit from it, and only one can, comes to my mind that is still claiming compatibility with Python 2 and so just can't use it, and that's the Squeezer project. You, uh, providing Ansible modules. And this tries to be kind of compatible with the same things Ansible is compatible, and there's still some Python 2 around. So maybe that will change in the near future. As I said, type annotations is one step to stricter typing in Python. So when you write a function, you say, OK, this function accepts three arguments, and the first one must be a kind of string. For well, the second one, I want a dictionary that takes strings as um, keys and can have whatever any type as um, values. And this function will return a object of that specific type or a subclass. And if you look at this example in the dictionary, there's already the any. And any is kind of the trap door to get to an untyped system again. And that's why I think it's coming to a middle ground. It doesn't really enforce every type to be very, very strictly defined. But you can kind of narrow it down to a level that you are confident with. Um, yeah, this is to say it's not a strict disqualifier for duck typing. Just it kind of exposes the places where you intentionally want to be uh, flexible on the type that you pass to a function. In my opinion, it helps architecturing code, because at some point you will realize, oh, I need to think of crazy types for this kind of function. And that's probably the point to think, is this function really in the right scope? May I need to? Think about splitting it because half of the arguments are roughly uh, are completely independent of the other half. So this may help 
uh, re restructuring your code to be in a better place. It definitely helps defining and ensuring contracts that when some code is calling another function that it can expect this function will return a specific type, the, these kind of contracts. And all I'm saying here, if you know C++, this is what you're used to. Um, in the case of uh, Pub CLI, we introduced it in a very, very early stage because it was a young project. This was rather easy. But at that point, we already had a bug that would have gone unnoticed forever, probably. And if you want, click on the link. Uh, I think it's very nice explained there. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is it makes a huge difference if whatever um, libraries or framework you use, if that framework already has type annotations your project can rely on, and this is about the contracts again, this is very, very helpful. And with this, I think we can start the open discussion here. And my question would be, how would you feel to introduce uh, type annotations into Pulp Core or its plugins? Yeah, go on, Tanya. Um, I actually have a question. <laughs> um, so I, I had an impression that um, it makes sense to introduce type annotations maybe in the like not in the whole code base but in like in the core parts or like the ones which are not changing significantly like in critical parts um is it i don't know your impression as well or not <laughs> and my second question in pulp cli or what i suggest to use like is it um static type checkers or dynamic like i'm fam very familiar with like mypy for example but uh, i wonder what you're using or what's the plan okay um the last question is very easy to answer it is mypy and just mypy benefits a lot from type annotations and yes it's a static type checker and that means um you don't change anything when you try to hack something away you, you just don't introduce the type annotations to run the code in your development and just experiment as always. But in the case of the CLI, uh, we have the strict flag on the MyPy run. And so it will just reject the linting when there's a missing, uh, there's an annotation missing. Um, your other question, Help me out, please. And um, like, how broadly we should you oh, think yeah. we should use the type annotations in the code base? Yes. Uh, let's first say you can um, uh, have not use the strict flag, and then you can just introduce the type annotations as you come along code, and it will check whatever is there and not complain if something is missing. So you can introduce it gradually. I'm not sure that will work out because inertia and laziness. And the CLI, at some point, I realized if I don't put the strict flag there, then we will just lose it. So that's, yeah, hard to say. Um, You can, however, configure the tool to check file by file. So if you maintain a list of the core parts of Pulp Core that should be very stable and uh, for all intents and purposes have a stable interface and ensuring these contracts I mentioned, then you could just say, okay, those are the five files and we want that to be uh, strictly checked by my file. I have a question. Does everyone know what type annotations look like? Might it help to pull up some code? Um, yeah, you... if you like, click on the link there and I'll do that. This is done, so. One sec. 
And now let me just um, share this tab instead. Is that working now? Yes. Yep. Uh, and shall I go here or yep. is it huh? file changes? Okay. So, so just tell me when to when to stop. A little bit further. Yeah, a little bit further. <laughs> oh, there. Stop, please. So, um, in this example, line fifteen, for example, uh, this is a class method. I don't know why, but self never gets an annotation, but that kind of seems to be clear to my pi that self is the object itself. So I'm fine with that. Uh, but the other op um, uh, parameter called object needs a type annotation. And so it's just introduced as colon any at that point. So it can get anything and it can return anything. Um, as this is part of a JSON encoder, it kind of must be that generic because it can be handed anything and try to produce JSON out of it. But if you go to, for example, line uh, 23, you see that you can be very specific that the second parameter here should be of the type of an open API. So, so an object of the class open API and the format should be a string. And this function will never return anything because it's the init. And the other type annotations you get are not parameters, but uh, when you define variables like in line 24, but it's almost the same syntax. Um, what I uh, may note is that in pulp core, we try to have kind of type annotations already in our um, doc strings or yeah I think it's the doc strings of functions but there's nothing to enforce them in any way and if you make them if, if you define them wrong here it will just complain about it and I've seen a lot of doc strings that didn't even have the right number of arguments anymore Yeah, that's we'll st that's kind of a challenging situation though because I agree with the value that's claimed here, but the doc strings are important for auto generated auto doc, so we're still going to need to keep them. But I think the yeah, auto doc will for generating oh. docs. Yes, I guess I'm not saying that we should should um, scrap the doc strings, but I believe that the auto doc will also read the type annotations. At least that's what I've seen on other projects. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, do you still need the doc string to give an explanation of what that object is? Cool, that sounds good. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm reading this as an, an, an addition to as opposed to a replacement for in that context. The one, so go ahead, Brian. I was, yeah, well, it would be a replacement. I think the claim is, um, and I don't know much about it, but is that it would be a replacement for the args, quargs, returns section. And that Sphinx's auto doc will auto correctly parse that. Maybe not a replacement entirely because uh, you, in the um, doc string, we have explanations of the arguments. But it mm. may replace the oh, often outdated type that we tried to annotate there. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. The, I just linked the package, and you don't have to indicate the type anymore, but you do indicate the um, what it's used for. So I definitely see, you know, value. However, um, I am. Uh, I feel uh, like it's a pretty big undertaking to introduce this everywhere, and I can't, I just can't uh, decide if the value 
outweighs, you know, the effort it will take to introduce it. When you started with the CLI projects, have you started to use type annotations right away or they have been added, I don't know, after some time? Um, it's the 15th pull request. So there was code already. And this yeah, code was bugged already and we found a bug that way. That's the story here. But yeah, the 15th, so it was very, very, very early. Is it possible to start small maybe? Like, could you add type annotations to like some of the plugin API code, like a directory and just have MyPy check it? And then you could sort of evaluate like how long did it take? What's the benefit of it? Um, you specify uh, specific files for MyPy to check. So I believe you can do it on a file by file basis. Yeah, if, if we do this sort of thing, I mean, doing starting small and picking kind of the highest value areas, I think that all makes good sense. Um, uh, I think it's clear, you know, I have mixed feelings on it, um, but not a definitive feeling either way, but it is clear to me that this will produce higher code quality. So I don't, that's not even a debate really in my mind, it's although other people may. Um, but what's not clear to me is if the opportunity cost of that time is better spent elsewhere. And that's an extremely difficult question to answer. Um, but I do think that it's easier to answer if we were to try it a little bit. Because right now, all I have is kind of a theoretical cost benefit analysis. Yep. And maybe if I did if we did pick at least maybe one or two modules that are you know very high value whatever that whatever those are maybe maybe i would have a very different perspective on its cost benefit analysis um, i'll also point out that in the life cycle of pulp um uh we do with pulp 3 i think that we do want more higher quality code and probably less, you know, at the expense of fewer features. Um, and like later in the week, I'm going to pitch totally rewriting every single test in pulp. So, um, I mean, I can very I much thought get you on. were going to say rewriting it in Rust. No, 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 no. Uh, um, That's Daniel's thing. Yeah. So, so like you know, I I can definitely get on board with with more code quality at the expense of fewer features. Um, so I, I think I'd like to try it in the small, I guess is what I'm saying after all that kind of open vague reflection. Um, I can just kind of have the impression that other projects introduced it in one go. So from one release to the next, there was type annotations or things like click, which we used here, for example. And I don't know if yeah. that if they just think we need they needed to do it or if there was a deeper reason i just don't know um grant so a couple of a couple of observations in terms of brian your comment especially on the high value targets for this where it feels to me like would be really useful is in the plugin authors api because it makes it easier for people not us as they're writing plugins to catch mistakes early in their cycle as opposed to you know running the code and then finding out that they've mistaken the type of something so if we we're going to target if we we're, we're going to target this that would be my suggestion for the first the, the first fruit to go for um, partially and this leads in, into my second observation having done uh, adding type annotations in pulp CLI adding annotations for a, a, a library that you're using a third party that you're pulling in, that doesn't already have them is way higher, way more of a pain than uh, than otherwise, because 
if the library already has it, then when you're calling that library's methods, you already know exactly what that library is telling you the type should be. You can you can add that to your code. It's all fairly straightforward. If the library you're calling doesn't have that, especially if you're trying to do a good job at type annotation and not just use any everywhere, which is like, you know, okay, we have the appearance of type annotations, but we're gaining no benefit from it. Um, it was it was a lot harder. Which is an, which to me says that the plugin API it, it reinforces that the plugin API is the place to do it. If I'm a community member that wants to write a new plugin and I want to use type annotations because that's what my organization does, it's a lot harder for me to do that in writing a pulp plugin if pulp doesn't have type annotations for the public plugin API than if it's already there. Um, so anyway, those are the those are my two thoughts on all this. Um, the completely personal one, having worked with this in Pulp CLI when I didn't know how it worked before, is when I'm heads down in the code and have been writing code that requires type annotations, it, it's fairly straightforward and I know what I need to do. If I'm away from that code and then I come back after a month and write, oh, I need to, I'm going to try and add some stuff to Pulp CLI and get started up again, it, it takes a while to get into the mindset. So personally, for me, Doing it all the time, once you, you're into the flow, is a lot easier. Coming in now and again and doing it, the startup time was large for me personally. Take for and that's worth you know every penny you pay for. That's an entirely a, a personal thing. No, I th I think that's a really good point because I I like using type annotations, but um, I've hit several instances where I've been really really frustrated with it. It can be challenging at times, especially when you start to learn it. You haven't learned it before. Yeah, I agree. Like when I was contributing to the Pulp CLI, um, I, I spent a while doing the type annotations. And that's not a bad thing, but there is a frustration element, which I think does speak to, you know, the fluency of doing it on a regular basis that I lack. You know, you have a question? Um, yeah. I guess I wouldn't be against trying this gradually. It's just if I understood correctly, it would sort of defeat the purpose if one wouldn't use the strict flag. And so gradually adding this wouldn't really work. Right? Um, yes. Uh, I try to combine this with Grant's um, uh, idea of introducing in the plugin API, and maybe that's the reason why it just won't work. Um, the plugin API is the thing that relies on everything else pulp. And so this may just say, OK, every library you are importing doesn't have it. This, this I can't check this. So maybe the place to start, but that's up to experiment, is the um, modules, which kind of, uh, so the ORM, which is kind of at the heart of the Django project and everything is depending on that. So maybe the, the point to start adding it gradually is looking at the dependency tree inside the project. Also, another question to maybe think about how would the back parts work into the releases which don't have type annotations at all? That's a good question. Probably you. Um, well, Python doesn't complain about them. So the question is if you still want to delete them on the cherry pick. Mm -hmm. So there would be some manual intervention. Well, it doesn't hurt to introduce them from, from the side of running Python. If you yeah, I think leaving the backport. Just ignore. Yeah, it'll just be ignored because it's part of the official Python language. Um, yeah, I, I agree. But that's a good point. I think the chances for merge conflicts goes up if we introduce um, type annotations. Just something to think about. Thank you. Grant? I was just going to ask, Is does Django itself uh, have type annotations? I should have looked that up. OK, no, we're, I, it doesn't have to be answered right now. It just occurred to me in the context of we, we talk to Django a lot. It would be helpful 
if we're going to do this if they already if they already are taking advantage of it i don't think so i just spot checked okay yeah i haven't noticed it like whenever i look at jungle code i don't recall any type annotations okay that makes me kind of sad because that does make it harder to um to do this just in, again, in my experience, it's a lot harder talking to a library that hasn't told you what it expects and trying to do the right thing in our in our code. You will need to define those types, right, yourself? Or you have a lot of any's all over the place. Yeah, and, and you just say whatever you import from that library, you ignore. Yeah. I mean, you can. MyPy, you can tell MyPy anything here's a, here's the pattern the regular expression of files that you're not going to care about even if you have strict typing turned on because that, that library doesn't have it um oh that's interesting david thank you yeah, it looks like maybe an unofficial um project So we are kind of coming close to time. Um, everyone, is there any any last question? Any last anything? Anything we need to park for another day? Um, well, so can we conclude the overall um, not acceptance? What's the right word here? The overall notion. Should we start? at least experimenting with it? Or should we wait until we know Django has proper type annotations for sure? Um, my take is that we should try an experiment, and I don't think we should wait for Django. Um, like, yes, it's a little bit complicated, but if we wait for Django, we could reschedule this talk for 2025. Um, and ultimately, like our concern is pulp's code quality. Um, and so um, I think I did hear, or maybe it's just that I agree with that um, the areas in core would be the highest value to the project overall. Um, and if that's the case, we can maybe have the core at the core um, weekly meeting and which is open, anyone can come to um, talk about kind of more tactical procedural scheduling for a small experiment, which I think will involve maybe one or two modules and um, enabling it in the CI and enabling it in the dev environment. That's that's more or less the work. I think it may already be there, but that's my perspective, though. Consensus is about the group's perspective. Um, I agree if it's very small effort to try just because I believe other things will take priority, unfortunately, as much as I would like to add this mm, to the critical parts of pull. Okay. I, I can say we do have some experience with it and we know how to run it. So to get it done on one file shouldn't be that much of an issue. And I think we should probably end this, I think, to give Mike a moment to set up. And I'm sorry to cut across whoever whoever's on mute. I, I heard there. I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you very much, Matthias. Thank you all.